Hey there, this is Nurse Keith. It's been a while since I took some time off, so for the next few weeks, I'm going to be doing just that by enjoying some time away with my wife, Shada, on our long-anticipated honeymoon. In the meantime, with almost 500 episodes to choose from, you've probably missed a few along the way, so I'm resharing some of my favorites for your enjoyment while I'm out of the country. These are fantastic guests with great stories to tell and awesome information and experiences that we can all learn from. So between now and October 11th, 2024, please enjoy these encore episodes of The Nurse Keith Show, and I'll see you again in mid-October. So that's worked, I think, very well in the ways in which I, man, you know, manifested. And I will say that I... Um, I try to hold those multiple perspectives because that's my definition of diversity. I mean, diversity is about difference, but holding multiple perspectives without judgment is what I want people to think about because it's the judgments that get us in trouble. What does it mean to be a black nurse who's the embodiment of the dream that Martin Luther King so famously described? Let's talk all about it with Dr. Rume Alexander, nursing professor, scholar in residence at the American Nurses Association and member of the Commission to Address Racism in Nursing, right here on episode 403 of The Nurse Keith Show. Hello there, this is Nurse Keith. This podcast is always about you and your personal and professional development, your career, the nursing profession, and the healthcare system in the big picture. And I'm here to share education, ideas, diatribes and informative interviews with some of the most inspiring people from the worlds of healthcare, nursing, medicine, entrepreneurship, and anywhere else I can find really cool, awesome people. I love having you along for the ride, and I thank you from the bottom of my nurse podcaster's heart for being part of the growing Nurse Keith Nation. And if you'd like to help other people find the show, which I hope you would like to do, consider leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon, Spotify, or just share the show with anyone you care to share it with. And if you want to become a patron at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Nurse Keith, you can support the show for as little as $2 a month. I appreciate you all so, so, so very much. And I encourage you to head over to nursekeith.com to find the show notes for this episode in the drop down menu labeled podcasts. As I mentioned, we are here with Dr. Rume Alexander, my friend, and someone you may have heard on a previous episode discussing the Commission to Address Racism in Nursing, which was episodes 381 and 382. And Rume, I'm so glad you're here, and I'm so glad I rescued you from a holiday party. And, <laughs> and tell me first, what brings you to that place and what does it mean to you to say I'm the dream who Dr. King was talking about? Well, it's good to be with you again, Keith, and I'm glad we're exploring some of those topics a little more deeply. There is this calling, if you will, um, that he put into the ethos, into the air about each of us using our voice and our influence to make the world better for those who come after us. To remember that alleviating suffering is something all of us can do, and it doesn't have to be huge, big things. It can be small things. But the Mm -hmm. point is that we not treat people as insignificant, that we not treat them as invisible, and that we think about what are the needs of anyone who is a part of the human race and to do that without judgment. So when he made his speech of the dream itself, which happened to be on my birthday, Hmm. um, I think it put me in the space of there were so many people before me who were so incredibly innovative and creative. You couldn't have survived in those times if you didn't, because there was clear divides about who should have what, who should des- who deserves what. And even if we had the ability to give them to all to withhold it. In fact, many of my ancestors would have been considered less than human. Mm-hmm. So I think the burden is uh, with a dream is that one day they were dreaming that there would be from 
future generations, people who would speak to these treatments of inhumanity, who would be empathetic to the needs of everyone and not judge people um, just by their skin color, but by the content of their character, as he often talked about. Exactly. And so I think that is that's a tremendous handoff, if you will, to those of us uh, who are in the current reality. But it's also a handout off for us to those who will come after us. And so that's where I, I sit. It's it's if they had had a chance to speak, if they had had a chance to talk, how straightforward would they have been? What would they have said? What would they have asked for? Mm-hmm. And quite frankly, I think that's respect, empathy, decency, a sense of belonging, a sense of being a part of humanity. And that's that's the piece I pick up. Um, I'm sitting at tables that they could have only dreamed about being at those tables. And for me to sit in any space and be quiet would really be almost the equivalent of denying them and their existence. So that is where that comes from. I see. So you have seats at all these different tables, which we'll talk about. And getting those seats at those tables, my assumption is, based on what I've learned about you and some of our conversations, is that those seats at those tables were not handed to you. Like those weren't like you didn't just stroll in and say, Hey, I want to seat at this table. So what has been your experience as a black woman, as a nurse, as a academic, as a scholar, you know, all the different roles you've played throughout your life and career that put you in the position to get those seats at those tables, whether in nursing or elsewhere. It's interesting that you would ask that question. It when I think about how I might answer you, it comes from a plethora of places. The bottom line is I needed to demonstrate that I had passed all the tests that they had passed, that I had gone to the schools they've gone to. I have met the qualifications designed by those unlike me. Knowing that the assumption is the only reason you're here is because you're a person of color and we need to indicate that we are diverse. So if we have one of you at the table, we have, we can check that box. Hmm. Now, as you mentioned earlier, I don't like being in boxes one and two checking the box doesn't help us move things to where they need to be. I think I've earned my space because in those spaces, I've often surprised people uh, and that I know or I've had experiences across a broad range of issues and topics, be it public policy, be it patient care delivery, be it being an academician, uh, be it being an author. Uh, And just life experience. And so when experience speaks, it speaks loudly. And I can I can pull from my own experiences and my own struggles and know that other people. Across the spectrum of race and gender and ethnicity and generational differences can relate. I try to make sure that when I'm communicating, it's very clear what I'm talking about so that we don't get off track and we stay focused on the issue. But uh, one of the things I established in the School of Nursing when I first came as the School of Nursing's Chief Diversity Officer was around holding these courageous dialogues. And they were courageous because nobody wanted to talk about them. People were fearful that if they got into that space and they really started to ask questions or explore things they've heard or they were passed along, or maybe even an observation that was true for the person that was in front of them, but doesn't apply to somebody like that person in the other setting. Um, They just wanted to keep that pin away somewhere. 
Hmm. for fear that um, their identity would be changed or people would see them different. And my true understanding was that the more I'm able to bring up the hard conversation and put light on the subject, the easier it is for all of us to talk uh, and for all of us to explore and to ask and to be curious rather than assume. Mm -hmm. Uh, to do away with some of that mislabeling that you've heard me talk about before. Yes. And, and, and to really just begin to say, look, we all come with biases and prejudices, stereotypes that we've heard. We need to understand that it's never a question about are those things in the room? The question is about how do they show up? And in today's society, they look very different in many ways to the way when my parents or grandparents were coming through uh, the world. This civilized oppression is what's going on now. Um, and in some ways, it's not even civilized anymore because with the polarities of the country comes a drop or a shedding of the civility and often very crass language, ways of relating to each other. And I heard a term this morning when I was dr uh, driving in to work. And it really sums up what I think we really should be spending some time on. And that's relational intelligence. Mm -hmm. We seem to be missing that. And, you know, how do we go about putting that back into space. Some of that social media stuff that uh, allows us to shortcut a conversation or word choice or get, keeps us from doing what you and I are doing now, and that's talking to each other and exploring ideas. There are some amazing minds out here who are doing some amazing work. But I truly believe that positive persistence pays. Mm -hmm. And if, if I can bring to the table a positive environment where these kinds of conversations can be held. I've truly lived out some of that dream, whether that's my parents, my grandparents, or is this Martin Luther King? Well said. And you said as chief diversity officer, that's at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I believe you had told me that you were the first black woman and nurse to hold that post at any university in the country. Is that true? Right. I'm the first... Uh, right, black woman in nurse in that role. Both of mm -hmm. uh, uh, now, that's not true across the country in terms of being chief diversity officer. There are many black individuals, but the nurse part is what's different mm -hmm. because that's the box. I see. If you're a nurse, they're thinking hospital or they're thinking healthcare environment or they're thinking a school of nursing mm -hmm. or they're thinking hospice or nursing home which we've all had black nurses lead. But for a university to have a nurse in that role, it was highly, highly uh, different from in the past and very unusual. There are others now who are doing similar kinds of work. They're in a, associate provost positions or uh, as I was an associate chancellor position. But that brings another kind of lens to that conversation, if you will, um, and, and how a university might go about dealing with some of the issues. Because mm -hmm. that nursing lens is all about eliminating suffering and seeing people as individuals, as you know, and how do we meet their needs when they need them in the way they need them. It is not a one size fits all. No, it's not. Right. And you, you've mentioned to me prior and your, it seems like part of your mission and where you've, where you've gotten to is like you said, prior to me, getting yourself into spaces where you can be heard and have more impact. And I wanted to ask you to speak to anyone listening whether they're a black nurse or a white nurse or Asian, it doesn't really matter. But someone who wants to get themselves into a space or 
insert themselves into a conversation, you know, have that seat at the table. You mentioned persistence. What else does it take for someone to put themselves in a place of feeling empowered enough to say, hey, I have something to say and I I deserve a place here? I don't know that there's one way to do it, but I'll tell you what I tend to do and how it works for me. Uh, Mm -hmm. I believe it's very important for one to be approachable. And that means, um, as I tell my students, your net work is your net worth, W-R-T-H. And so growing that network where people get to know you and get to get a sense of your personality, get a sense of um, the ease at which you can talk about different subjects or your knowledge about different subjects. Uh, it always was a, a good place to start is when people found out I was a nurse. That, that's that's an easy one. Every You know, folks love nurses. Uh-huh. So, you know, <laughs> oh, you're a nurse. What kind of nurse? And it just leads to all kinds of conversations that you can build from. So you're looking for that commonality with the persons that you're a part of to go outside the normal groups that a nurse would play a part in. So I might go over to the business school or to a business symposium. I might go to an anthropology lecture. If you ask questions and you go to the microphone, usually you have to tell your name and who you are and what you do. That's how people get to know you. One can write on subjects so that people get to know you that way. Mm -hmm. The volunteering, again, is around the networks. You never know who knows who. I met someone in the airport the other day who literally promotes people in California and Hollywood and that space. And we met going through the check through at the airport. She beeped. I didn't. And uh, so she got stopped and checked and I was putting my things in the bag and we were laughing about how much you have to undress and then dress back. Mm-hmm. But then she asked me, approachable, what I did. And, blah, blah, blah. and that led to a whole nother level of conversation. And come to find out, we knew some, some people, similar people. And I'd never met the woman before. But it's going to end up being a connection uh, in the space of cultural history of the Black experience. And, and her ability to connect. So those, those are ways in which I move into the space. I try to always leave people with a provocative question. I like, one of the uh, adjectives that I love for people attached to me is a provocateur. Hmm. I, yeah. So I like to leave them with a provocative question, something that makes them really think through how they're living their life, how they're using their voice or how they're using their influence. Provocateur. Provocateur. So as, as a nurse, as a woman, as a black woman, as a scholar, you're the scholar in residence at the ANA, for instance, you were the president of the NLN national league for nursing from 2017 to 2019. So you've, you've had a seat and a voice in all these different circles. And what I see in you is this, obviously this powerful intellect. And I also see this curiosity, you know, you're like, oh, you meet this person at the airport and you strike up a conversation and you're curious enough, you're open enough just to let that conversation evolve. evolve. And then you never know, like you said, your network is your net worth. You never know what's going to lead to what. And if you want to get a seat at certain tables, the serendipity of a particular meeting could turn into, it could be worth its weight in gold. You're absolutely right. And I think one of the other powerful places are boards uh, and, and those kinds of where collective minds come together. Hmm. Um, and they're thinking about the future and they're thinking about the resources that are needed for the future. And when I say resources, I'm talking about time, money, and people. 
And those tables are curious enough that they tend not to pay as much attention uh, about gender or ethnicity, but about the idea. And so I love that exchange of ideas. That's very energizing. And the more you have read from different disciplines and you've been involved, the more you can move around in the conversation and you can connect dots in a way that others might not because you've had a different of a difference of experience. And so I find that to be uh, a wonderful way of using your full self. And it's another way of creating an awe in the room. And, and, and some people talk about it being inspiring. I talk about it being awe-spiring, mm-hmm. uh, where you create that sense of mystery. We're not sure the journey we're going, but we need to be agile enough to be able to move with the way the current reality is moving and adjusting. And I think that's exciting. I think trying new things, whether they work or don't work, is exciting in and of itself. And so um, I love board work because I really do get to meet all, a lot of different people from a lot of spaces. And I find that I, uh, even though we all have the same information or we are hearing the same finance report or trend report, I will apply that information differently because I'm using that nursing lens. Mm-hmm. I'm also using the lens of being a part of an underrepresented ethnic minority. I know for a fact is as you work up and down on the minority ladder, the black female is to- is at the bottom. Mm-hmm. And so I like a challenge and I know they're not expecting much of me. For those reasons, what they see. Your audience doesn't know, but I'm barely five one. Mm-hmm. So they put that as part of of the picture, uh, you know, in terms of what I might bring because of stature. And that's that element of surprise. And so um, what I want to do in that space is I'm joining you in thinking about things that are important to you. And by the way, you didn't realize we were talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging. So let me connect that dot. Let me help you with that piece. And I think that's worked very well for me. Um, And I think it works well for the boards that I'm on because it moves them into other spaces and challenges. Uh, I often find that during the break, people will pull me over because they've got a specific question going on in their space and they didn't have a place to go in that's safe and mull it through. And I'd like to think I project that safety, uh, that there's not a question you can't ask me, you know. Right. And if you're focused on relational intelligence and that ability to relate to others and have them relate to you, then you are the person that they're going to pull aside at the break and talk to and trust, right? Yes. Maybe with a question that they were a little squeamish about asking in the group, but they wanted to run it by you and they felt like, oh, Dr. Alexander will answer my question and she won't judge me and she'll, she'll give me some information or set me straight. Or I will connect you with, others that I think in the space, um, depending on what you're asking, that you could get more information from. But it goes back to your comment about impact. Mm-hmm. When I make that connection, it's that's a spread. It's, it's almost like the butterfly effect. It's not just uh, that I'm talking to a few people that I care for each day, but it's reaching beyond that. And I don't know who they're going to carry that message to, but I know it's left me. And they are moving it into another space that impacts or will impact or could have the potential to impact the other audiences that they speak to. So this is about what, how can I be in the words of social media an influencer? How can I bring that, that into the space And um, I was just, I'm on the Leapfrog board, which is a board, uh, which is an organization that grades hospitals and ambulatory surgical care centers around patient safety. But without having diversity 
of perspective and thought, a diverse workforce. Dealing with issues of diversity, you can't have patient safety. The two go together Mm -hmm. and they travel together. And now if you're comfortable about having safety for some patients, fine. But if you're talking about you don't know who's going to walk through your door, your market share, the way it's shifting and changing, the demographics are changing. You need that diverse thread in your plans, be it strategic planning, mission, vision, your committee structures, because it's actually an organizational overlay. What people don't often realize is they're always talking about it. They just don't know they're talking about those topics. Hmm. And so I like to listen and then pull out that thread in the sweater. Here's the diversity thread or the equity thread or the inclusion thread Mm -hmm. or the belonging thread. There it is. Uh, and, And you were talking about this, this, and this, but you didn't know you were talking about this. And I'm excited you're talking about it. And let's talk about it some more. So that's kind of the mm-hmm. path to get in. And if you're the provocateur, then you're the one pulling the thread. I'm the one pulling the thread. It's well, like, did you realize you were having that conversation mm-hmm. and how these two relate? Let me help you with how that is related. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's worked, I think, very well um, in the ways in which I man, you know, manifest it. And I will say that I... Um, I try to hold those multiple perspectives because that's my definition of diversity. I mean, diversity is about difference, but holding multiple perspectives without judgment is what I want people to think about because it's the judgments that get us in trouble. That's so important. And when we come back from the break, I want to talk more about your career and some of the other accomplishments that define who you are and how you see yourself. And there's just there's so much to talk about and i <laughs> you you have such a valuable you make such a valuable contribution to these conversations and i'm so honored to have you here so we'll be right back with the second half of episode 403 with dr rume alexander hey everyone let's take a quick pause for the cause shall we Thanks for being a valued listener of The Nurse Keith Show. And if you'd like to help other people find the podcast, please consider leaving a rating and review over on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. This really helps propel the show and grow our audience. And I truly appreciate everyone who's already taken the time. And if leaving a public rating review isn't your thing, why not tell a colleague about The Nurse Keith Show by sending them a link so they can listen for themselves. After all, word of mouth is the most organic way for me to reach those who truly need to tune in. So if you'd like to do me a solid, please consider leaving a rating review or telling a friend or colleague. And by doing so, you'll be helping The Nurse Keith Show reach more and more nurses and healthcare professionals all around the world. Now, let's get back to today's conversation. Welcome back to the second half of the episode. We're here again with my friend and friend of the pod, Dr. Rume Alexander. And Rume, prior to the break, we were discussing so much relational intelligence, diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI. We're talking about you being the first Black woman and nurse to hold a chief diversity officer position at any university in the country. And you're the scholar in residence at the American Nurses Association. You're obviously an accomplished academician and scholar, professor. You've you've been around the block in the nursing world and healthcare. So being a scholar in residence, when I heard that, when I first met you, back when we were having the whole commission on the show, I'd never heard of a scholar in residence within the nursing world before. Were you the first scholar in residence of the ANA? I think ANA has had one or two others in maybe public policy. Mm -hmm. And and but the whole point was having someone who lives in their world, in their organizational space. And because I had um, 
done the work in diversity and inclusion and the chief diversity officer work, but I'd also been a hospital association um, executive uh, that dealt with public policy in Tennessee Hmm. and some of the lobbying efforts in the healthcare space. And um, I had been actually an employee as an association executive. So Again, I'm eclectic. I put all, I, I mix all my worlds and I pull whatever from wh- whichever one helps me in that moment. And so they're in association with members and people who are in associations join because they need the care and feeding as a membership. So when you've been the president on one side, and you've also been a staff member in an association of, You can see both sides of the picture and what the issues are for one side versus the issues are for another side. And yet in this space where you have to thread the needle carefully to navigate the space, that was what they were asking. So you've got these tremendous, just brilliant nurses at the table on a topic that is that the world struggles with. And so now they're pulling on all the me's, I like to say, to help with the navigation of that space. And being the scholar in residence, what kind of voice are you bringing to the conversation? Like, what what do you see your role right now at the ANA in that particular in that particular world at this time? So it is the equity impacts piece okay. to decisions and actions. It's what do the what historically has kept nursing from not being as diverse? Because that's where they started. Why is it, why, why is nursing not as diverse as it should be? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? And I have to give ANA all manner of praise because they wanted to honestly examine what they have done in the past that might have prevented that movement, why was it important for nursing organizations that are more racial or ethnically collective? That's why they formed themselves so they would be around like people. Why did they move out of the ANA and create these special interest groups? So what um, in the business world they call employee research resource groups. These are resource groups. Uh, and it was because a su- ANA was not necessarily meeting the needs. And if you look at the report of the commission in the historical section, that is what ANA brought to the table. That they they that got lifted. ANA didn't try to hide it or what I call use the kitty litter routine. Hmm. So they didn't try to, you know, cover it up and act like Nothing's happening, but they were willing to really not only understand it, but to own their part in how this has structured the lives of nurses of color. Then how that has played professionally within the nursing profession. So did we advocate for the things that would have brought more equity or did we allow just the majority membership by race create the rules and the standards and the way of being. Mm -hmm. We're also very much aware of the fact that we're the most trusted profession. And that for those of us that are nurses, we love that, that, that title we've earned it. And I think it's great. And most nurses do too. But what nurses also know is when we're with each other, There are other things that sometimes we struggle with because of our differences. And part of the association's work is to help bridge the understanding. And it needs to model what it promotes. So those were pieces of work they were asking me to help them think through. Because again, the majority of ANA is not only female, it's white female. And that's a that's a way of thinking. That's a way of being. That's a way of doing. And what 
I could bring to the table was being a nurse of color, but also having navigated all these spaces, including being a part of association work, either as leading a national organization in education or as one who lobbied for public policy because of an association and its membership and what people were wanting to get for their dues dollar. And I'll be totally honest with you. People knew that I just call it as I see it. Hmm. Um, I don't sugarcoat it. And I say, look, we got to have some of these hard conversations. We got to unpack some of this uh, baggage that nobody wants to open up. But it's going to be good for us. It's going to be hard for us. But in the end, it's going to be good for us. We'll be strengthened by it. And we can model for the world how this can be done. So um, ANA has constituency members in each state. So as the national and the largest nursing organization with a, for the first time, a black male as the president, who also had interest in the space and who also our paths have crossed and he knows me well, said, can you help me with this? And that is the work of us coming collectively because nobody does this work alone. It, it takes everybody to do this work. But the conversations, the topics we needed to, to tackle, uh, some of the questions that needed to be asked and the safe place for the nurses who were not in power, the underrepresented nurses, were to talk about how this civilized oppression occurs, how this use of power gets misused, how they get misunderstood, and how what I call the moral assault on their spirit hmm. would occur. Moral assault. The moral assault. The, wow. the deep, yeah. the yeah. deep, deep, deep wound that really is very hard to heal because your personhood, your personhood has been questioned mm -hmm. and sometimes crushed. And out of that, you the opportunities to be all you can be over against, this is only the part of you they want. I, they just want a little sliver of you and you can't bring your whole self. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of work. It, that's a lot of work when you can't be authentically you and you're trying to fit somebody else's box or description. You have families just like they do. You have needs just like they do. You have bills just like they do. But you also want to move up. You want to promote, be promoted, to be noticed for the work you do. And those are the sides. Those are the sides of the box you talk about kicking down. Right. Throughout That's your life correct. and throughout your career. And, right. you know, I'm, I'm looking at an infographic from minoritynurse.com from 2021. And it says that nursing, the profession itself, is 75% white and 23% black. And then we go down Hispanic, Asian, two or more races, and then Native American or American Indian, 0.6%. So, yeah, this must be part of the conversation you're having within the ANA and the other, the other worlds in which you circulate. Yeah. And absolutely. The nurses are um, uh, just the other day, there was a meeting and the Haitian nurses were a part of that conversation, the Nigerian nurses. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that uh, when people start counting the demographics of the country, they tend to put all the Brown people in one category. Mm -hmm. Okay. Someone who's born in, outside the U.S. and is a person that looks like me, who's, 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 who people would look at and assume that they're Black. They are, but they're Black along with where they came from. And mm -hmm. to that extent, they approach the world differently. They don't, uh, they don't understand slavery and being brought to the country without even being asked as opposed to someone who decides to immigrate. It's a very different perspective. Oh it's a very yeah. different perspective. And they we should not be lumped. No. And together. I, we but we yeah. should all be understood. Yeah. I mean I have Haitian family members. My niece yes. married a Haitian man. So my little great niece is four years old. She's 
half Haitian and half Jewish American. Yes. Um, my other <laughs> great niece is 16. She's a Haitian immigrant. So their perspective on life in the United States is quite different. It's very different. And my 16-year-old great niece wants to become a doctor and go back to Haiti and help help her people there. Mm-hmm. So they but they face the same challenges and struggles here being being people of color here in the Correct. United States and for for nurses specifically because that's part of your world is having been a nurse for so long there are stereotypes of being a black woman right right and then being a black female nurse for instance right and what can those nurses do they join organizations they speak up do they become provocateurs as well you know how can they might they, they might have shown how to be or they've got models of how to do that but i how think to, how what to they do it bring, well how to do it well i think i see um there's this great fear of anger and anger can build up and when anger shows up it is mm-hmm. it can be it can distort when you're angry you don't hear as well and you're you're all about self protection and safety and yeah, you're going to fight to protect your life. So people see that fight and they just make the assumption that they had nothing to do with what you're fighting about. You're just fighting and you're in somebody's face and you're telling somebody off when without understanding the context and then making an assumptions about all black nurses or mm-hmm. all Native American nurses or mm-hmm. all Hispanic nurses. And that's where we get into trouble. Okay, so this is about not only managing the self, which is something we put in one of our infographics of the commission work, is that you have to manage yourself. You have to know when people are pushing your buttons. You're human. And there, somebody may say or do something that really does send you into another <laughs> space, mm-hmm. and you need to know when that happens and how to remove yourself from those situations. That's because you're not at your best self when you're angry. It conf- Anger confuses. It does. It confuses. So, you know, you need to go recalibrate. And that means you got to pull out of that to do it. So that's that's part of the the work on self-awareness that you one needs to be a part of. But at the same time, those nurses bring a level of trust to patients who relate to them. Mm -hmm. And often because they don't have to meet the trust test. They get information that would have otherwise not been revealed and may be the very answer to the treatment that they need. Mm -hmm. Well, people, people do like to see healthcare providers who look like them. Yeah. You know, whether it's a doctor or a nurse practitioner or anybody in the work field, because you feel like you have an advocate at the table, someone Mm -hmm. who understands you and how you might be looking at this and thinking about. What does this mean for someone who comes from this cultural background? Mm -hmm. And so uh, this this again is about this is why it's tied to patient safety. You you will remember this topic from the past when you were in school. There's this phenomenon. I was a pediatric nurse when I was on the floor and uh, we talked a lot about this failure to rescue. So infants whose moms, don't, they don't talk to them, they don't nurture them, they don't hold them. The baby, even though they can't talk, sense this detachment. And without that love and care and nurturing, the baby dies. Mm-hmm. Even though there's plenty of food there, there's, they lose their appetite because they feel this sense of not being wanted. It is an element that all of us are born with. We want to be included. Now, play that out to someone who's 20, 25, 30, 45. Same phenomena. I'm not mm-hmm. being fed. Mm-hmm. It's as right. if I don't exist. It's that invisibility. It's that invisibility mm-hmm. and it's that insignificance, which I think is our um, biggest issue, along with polarity. You either see it my way 
or take the highway. There's just no there's no meeting in the middle. There's no trying to understand other perspectives. And so, understanding that 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 knowing that other perspective doesn't necessarily ch- mean you have to change and do everything they do. But you might learn a little something that you could use <laughs> or that would make your life better. But at least you understand their context and where they're coming from. So I think and you're you- intimating talking with and, and trying to understand people with whom you might disagree. Yeah. Yeah. Disagree or it's not a practice. Okay. That you are a part of, or you've always placed a judgment on that because of the stories that have been passed down. Um, those kinds of things. And that can get in the way of truly caring for somebody or wanting to do something for someone whom you blame because they're, you think they're barbaric or you think they're antiquated, or you do, you know they have animalistic behaviors. And we still hear some of that kind of thinking when we start exploring that. But it's, they didn't start out that way. Somebody fed them that. Yes. Family, they didn't come, yeah, friends, they didn't come here with that knowledge. This is, this is being fed from different organizations, different parts of our environment and world, and we're all products of the time in which we were born. And where and who was talking to us and who was around and what stories got passed. Um, I often talk about stories. All stories lead you to where you are now. So if you can hear people's stories. You can find, you know, just listen and let them tell their stories. You can learn so much. About who they are, where they're coming from, why they approach the world the way they do. And to be quite honest with you, if I'd been born in the, under those same conditions and in that same space, would I be any different? Because mm-hmm. we're all shaped by people who we felt trust, you know, we trusted, who we felt loved us deeply, wanted us to be protected. And they were passing down the stories they heard and never explored and found out whether they were true or not. So this is it, this is the work, I think, of the commission. It is what we were trying to model is. How do we understand it? Because the commission was not A and A's. The commission was four organizations. Mm -hmm. Okay. The reckoning statement was A and A's statement. And it grew from the work of the commission. And this is where A and A, as the largest nursing organization, this 1.4 million, is talking about all the things they did that pulled these different racial, ethnic groups, sometimes gender groups, sometimes sexuality groups, uh, physical ability. It cre- it, because of the way it was being managed by the majority, these groups didn't feel that their needs were being met, being taken seriously, or being addressed. And so what an inclusive act it is to say, we're bearing witness to the things that we've done where others are, are telling us their stories and how important it is to have allyship, which is what I think people also need this, this sense of um, I'm not alone in this. I have part, I have friends, I have people that I can get information from. I have mentors. I have sources that can help me navigate these unusual spaces. Mm-hmm. Um, I used to tell this story about when I worked at the hospital association, they gave us a public relations uh, that made all the executives go through this public relations training because TV, you know, we were being interviewed. I will never forget that um, a white female who was training me told me that I looked too young. I need to pull my hair back all the time so I would have an older look. She put makeup on me that worked on not people of color. And Mm -hmm. I looked ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And I finally just looked at her and said, you mean well, and I know you mean well, and you know your business, but you don't know how to take care of this. Hmm. Yes. And so guess what? I'm not pulling my hair back. In fact, most women like to look younger than they are. I can't imagine me making myself look older. I got plenty of time to look older. So I'm Mm going to just own what I've been given in terms of look 
And I'm pretty sure I use a different makeup than you do. Hmm. And I'm pretty sure I know how to look fairly presentable in the space. What I need from you is the knowledge about question, how to answer questions and explore and be myself. And that's why I'm here. But it was interesting because it was, you need to do what I do. That is interesting. And <laughs> as we wind down, you, you've you created a career, you've created a life in which your, your mission, I, I just feel like you're one of those people who lives their mission every day. And you mentioned earlier that MLK gave his dream speech on your birthday, August yes. 28th. Yes. Emmett, Emmett Till's funeral was held on your birthday. Correct. Obama accepted his nomination on your birthday. Correct. So your this history that you embrace and the people who you look to as your your ancestors, the people, the progenitors, you know, the ones whose shoulders mm-hmm. you stand on yes. are they're important to your story and you're important. You're one of those giants upon whose shoulders others are now standing. So I believe through all these things you've done, Chancellor for Diversity and Inclusion, being on the commission to address to address racism in nursing, your assistant dean of relational excellence at the Adams School of Dentistry. So you get that little nursing, inserting nursing into dentistry. <laughs> And I know you like to tell the people at the nursing school that at the dental school that you don't believe in truth decay. And and that that I think that sort of encapsulates you, that you're you're sort of the seeker of of truth and clarity. And yeah, and I want to be helpful in shaping the cultures because culture can, as you know, eat strategy for lunch every day of the week. And so much mm, is well said. So much of the work is around the creating cultures where people can flourish. Yes. And my biggest role over in the dental school is around the culture piece. Mm-hmm. So, and I'm defining culture as the way people do what they do, the decisions they make, the resources they allocate, who they hire who they promote, who they interview, Mm -hmm. the directions they're taking, because they're shaping the future and they're shaping students coming through the system. I am looking at the curriculum. What messages are no longer true that need to be eradicated? What needs to be expanded? You know, if a student gets a syllabus and all, all of the authors the articles and the books that they're reading were written by white individuals. We have not done well by them. Mm-hmm. They need the diverse perspective. That's what education's about, that exposure. So um, it's not unusual for people to send me their curriculum and to critique where I think they could bring diversity into the space. And that's what I meant by the thread, mm-hmm. the invisible thread, because I'm going to pull that out. I'm going to notice that. Uh, the programming you 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 bring in these high powered speakers and they're all one color or they're all one race mm-hmm. not having diversity of speakers to me that's a form of negligence mm-hmm. uh on the part of the planner sometimes that's unintentional but if i'm sitting in the audience and particularly i know this from my own experience that's the first thing we look for do I see anybody up on that stage just like in a, in a healthcare environment? Is there anybody there that looks like me? And where they're missing, that creates a whole nother dynamic on, in, in people's spirit, in their heads, and in their hearts. Mm. So how do we make this so that it's as, as inclusive as it can be? Who's missing from the table? That's, that's always the question I leave with people. It's like at every gathering you should ask who's missing from the table and then figure out how to get them to the table why are they missing and for those who've been clamoring for a seat at that table maybe you need to answer their phone calls (laughs) maybe you right or or, or their request or or begin to go in some of the spaces where they are Mm -hmm. and, and understand um why they might be missing, but you might also find a, a really rich reservoir of people if you expand who you have dinner with, where you go and dine, where you go and worship, where mm-hmm. you go and have meetings. Mm-hmm. Um, 
right now, currently, I, I also chair, um, I'm United Methodist, and I chair for this predominantly white congregation. I am the chair of their council. It's their administrative arm of the church. They've not had a person of color in that space. That's got to do with, I'm just there. I started going to that church. I just, you know, there were certain committees I like to be a part of and things I like to do. We got to know each other. We had a common belief system. That was what we had in common. And then the pastor calls and says, I need you to lead the leadership of the church. And I remember saying to him, is this going to get you in trouble? So it's going to cause you problems. And he says, we're in church. If this gets us in trouble, we got bigger issues. Uh, not to this day have I ever had a problem uh, or any issues. So, you know, you can assume that people don't want you in the space. Mm -hmm. That's not always true. They just might not know how to invite you or how to bring you in. Yeah. And there you are. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you come in and you become part of the table. And it's interesting what the universe will do to help you out. You, you know, you pointed out something and uh, that you re reminded me of just about every job I've ever had, other than being a nurse at the bedside, I had to create what that job looked like. It was a new position and all they knew is they needed somebody, but they didn't know what it was supposed to do or how it was. And I actually like defining that space over against walking into already developed spaces. Mm -hmm. And so every leadership position I've had, I've created the, this is, this is how I think it sh can operate. This is, this allows me to bring my hopes and dreams and wishes for everyone to the table. Um, it allows me to negotiate and have people think about and hopefully bend their minds to, as King would say, the arc towards justice um, and began to really just say, can we just be who we say we are and what we say we're about? Well, I know and I hope that this will inspire others to ask those questions and insert themselves into conversations. And we could talk all day, Rume, but we do have to um, wind down. And I have four quick questions for you that I ask okay. all my guests. And they necessitate fairly quick answers because we're we're here at, towards the end. Sure. But the first one is, um, how do you define success personally or professionally? When you have delivered your best self, hmm, I like and that. you can leave it. You, you you have no doubts about it. Hmm. You did what you could, good. even though you're not in control. Mm -hmm. Good. The second one is, could you name or describe someone who's inspired you in the course of your life? It could be a, a famous person or someone you just know personally, and they could be living or dead. Just someone who really stands out for you. Yeah, there's a recent person and then there is a back in the past person. Mm -hmm. So my mother, who only had a seventh grade education was a remarkable woman and was very, made it very clear that I'm not better than anyone, but they're not better than me and that I could compete with anybody if I had the same resources and the same opportunities. Hmm. So my mom, and then when I think about it, uh, Michelle Obama's a pretty good, she's a pretty good provocateur. Mm hmm and uh, she, I think she also inspires me greatly. Oh, good. Those are, that's wonderful. Let's see. Third, the penultimate question is, is there a book or a movie, doesn't have to be an absolute favorite, that's had an impact, a major impact on the way you think or maybe the way you live? There is a really old movie called Backstreet. Mm-hmm that I really enjoyed. And it was about a caretaker of this white family. The, um, and the caretaker became pregnant by the white male of the household, had the baby, the baby looked white. Um, and there was this great discussion about 
revealing who her mom was. And it's not until the very end when the mother dies, the black mother dies, that she admits that that's her mother. And the regret of, of treating her mom as insignificant, as not a part of the family, was gripping. Mm-hmm. And there's a song in there called, um, that's used a lot in the African-American church, but I've heard it in white churches as well. Um, Soon I will be done with the troubles of this world. And this, Mahalia Jackson is singing this song. So it's got all the movement and all the feel and et cetera. And I watch that one probably twice a year. It just reminds me of the things that can keep us from loving each other, caring for each other, even when the bloodline is there. Mm-hmm. Um, how strong that is to um, the values we've attributed to skin color mm. and how that can create us se- being separated rather than being the loving community that we ought to be. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you. I'll put that one on my list for sure. And the final question. Bring your t- bring your tissue when you watch it too. You'll need your box of Kleenex. I shall. I shall. <laughs> All, All right. right. The last question. What's one piece of advice you'd give 18-year-old Rume at this point in time, whether you think she'd listen or not? What would you tell her? You have no idea what's in store for you and where you will end up. So spend less time worrying about what other people think of you and let your GPS, your North Star, be about what you truly want your life to be about. And what you know at 18 is that when people suffer, it breaks your heart. And you want to alleviate suffering. And that can look and be and be activated in a million and one ways. So just go be you and remember that that's your guide. Hmm, That's beautiful. Thank you. Thanks, Rumi. And I think everyone listening, I'm sure whether they're 18 or 58 like me, could relate to that particular (laughs) piece of advice. Well, Dr. Rumi Alexander, thank you so much. This has been so wonderful. You're, You're an amazing woman, amazing nurse and, and scholar. And I, it's just an honor to have you here a second time. I'm so glad to be with you, Keith. And I do hope that, um, your listeners will find some bit or glimmer of help in our conversation and time. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you. Well, there you have it. Thanks for listening to this inspiring episode of the Nurse Keith Show. Remember, head over to nursekeith.com to the show notes under the podcast drop-down menu to learn more about Dr. Rume Alexander. If you need personalized holistic career coaching for your career, look no further than nursekeith.com. Mention the show to me when you email me and you get a 10% discount off your first coaching package. We're a proud member of the Health Podcast Network at healthpodcastnetwork.com. We are adroitly produced by Rob Johnston of 520R Podcasting and Mark Cappies Beeson is our stalwart social media ringmaster and newsletter wrangler. Before we say goodbye, I'll leave you with this quote, one that you'll recognize if you listen regularly. This is by the musician Robert Fripp. May my living honor my parents. May my living repay the debt of my existence. Be well, dig deep, seek joy, keep in touch. This is Nurse Keith saying adios till next time from beautiful Santa Fe, New Mexico. And my friend and friend of the pod, Dr. Rume Alexander, saying adieu from beautiful blue skies of Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Thank you so much, Rume. Thanks to everyone for listening. And we will catch you on the proverbial flip side. <laughs>